Quick show of hands, how many people in the room use Slack on a daily basis? Oh my goodness. Wow. This audience is yours. <laughs> Very little upside in me showing up here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, I told you already that I, I want to spend as little time as possible uh, discussing your IPO because I think you know IPOs themselves are less interesting than, than the companies and the people and the things that you're doing. That said, um, first question about the IPO that you did last month is if you could just tell everybody, why, why do a direct listing which is um, unusual? Sure. So in a, a this is probably pretty basic for everyone, but in a traditional IPO, a uh, company sells a bunch of shares to the bankers who underwrite it, and then they go on to sell shares to investors. And then on the listing day, the investors sell some shares to the general public, and the stock starts trading. But the key part of that is the company sells a bunch of shares, so you dilute the existing shareholders. We uh, took advantage of the very generous funding environment over the last um, five years and had over $800 million in the balance sheet, so we didn't need to raise any new money, but we still wanted to be public. We have... Um, a number of large enterprise and government customers, and they would, uh, they have historically asked for our financials. It gives us some credibility. It opens us up to um, other parts of the capital markets. So that was it. <laughs> so that was it that you, uh, so if I can boil that down, you didn't need the money, in other words. Didn't need the money. And there's some, I, mean, I think not having the lockup seems more fair. So instead of having one seller and a few buyers, like a handful of buyers, you had many, many sellers, pretty much any existing shareholder, and um, as many buyers as um, the market would bear. And in the event, it was actually it was interesting. It's a little unfair to compare it to a traditional IPO because the dynamics are different. But the the opening trade, so there's a, a market maker, um, and a, the kind of the bankers are building a book and getting buys and asks, and um, eventually they find a clearing price. And there's one initial big block trade, and that was um, the third biggest in the history of the New York Stock Exchange. So Alibaba, Facebook, and then us. And, and actually, I find that even though I, I read everything as carefully as I could, I still don't understand the mechanics, so maybe some, maybe some other people don't. Where do those shares come from? Those shares come from our existing investors, from employees. There was actually a pretty big chunk um, that was just the shares that were sold for withholding taxes on uh, employees' RSUs, for example. So, so they raise their, you, you say, who wants to sell in the IPO, which is, will be done as a direct listing, and people raise their hands and say, I will. Yeah, I understand that we have a commissioner from the SEC here, so we feel very well regulated. And I would point out that we weren't allowed to tell anyone to buy or sell or facilitate transactions or suggest that anyone do anything, and of course we did not. Um, but <laughs> but everyone, everyone knew, um, and they got plenty of notices that went out and stuff like that. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons I sort of downplay this, the talk about the IPOs is that you know, once upon a time, they were just financing events. They were an opportunity to raise capital. And for you, for Slack, it wasn't even that. But it still is a milestone of achievement. And um, I think for you, it was, a, it was a, at multiple levels, it was a personal achievement. And you have a little something you'd like to show and narrate, if you would. I, yeah, I'd love that. So first of all, uh, we had a bunch of customers on the podium with us. You get, it was a very uh, fraught process. You get 14 people to come up. <laughs> Uh, on the podium to find out who your yeah. friends are, right? <laughs> yeah. So we took the, the formal uh, Section 16 officers of the company and then eight customers. So we had um, Paul Cheeseborough, who may be in the room but is attending mm -hmm. the conference, uh, the CTO of Fox. Um, we had people from Oracle, um, uh, from all different kinds of companies, and we had a bunch of customers outside because you get like the whole outside to, to kind of make a statement. So Cole Hahn was giving away shoes, and uh, Molly Moon Ice Cream was giving out little ice cream things. So it becomes quite an event. But the big one for me, if you could show the picture, um, I, uh, I got my mom to come. And this is me taking a selfie with her. Thank you. What's awesome, I didn't have time to get the rights for it, unfortunately. But Reuters took a photo of me taking that photo. And that went out on the wire. So like a bunch of the newspapers the next day were me and my mom holding the camera. Um, <laughs> And then the, the other part that was really cool, so I said there's a market maker and they're building up this big uh, order book. And that took a couple of hours. But most of the execs team wanted to be back in San Francisco at headquarters um, to be with the team uh, at the end of the day. So we had to leave right away before the stock actually opened. My mom loves talking to just about anyone. So she's wandering on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange. And if you could play the video, um, the woman on the right side there is the CEO of the New York Stock Exchange, Stacey Cunningham. And that's the guy from Citadel doing the market book. And then there's my mom, who's really trying to understand exactly what she's 
doing. She gets to ring the bell to open our, uh, open our shares for trading. <laughs> That's really sweet. So in the same way that uh, you know there, you have so many uh, customer users, I don't know about customers, user, users in the room. You know, one of the things that, that journalists have loved about Stuart over the last handful of years, he's one of these rare executives, including of a private company, who actually answers people's questions and with data. Uh, I would call you up and you'd say, well, here's how many customers we had, and here's how it's changed, and 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 so on. And uh, you're also the uh, the rare CEO who who who, can, who has a photo of his mom to show uh, yeah. fr from the ringing of the bell. So. Thank you for that, Stuart. You're welcome. Okay, now, so you know, you know there's a you know there's a butt coming here, right? Yes. So okay. The, so I'm I'm going to I'm going to role play a little bit because yep. I I use Slack, but the Fortune journalists in the room, in particular the younger ones, know that I was a reluctant user of Slack. I said, why are you bothering me with this thing? Email's just fine, and and by the way. Don't send me something urgent on, on, on Slack because I might not see it. I might not get to it. Send me an email, all right? Mm -hmm. So um, you're, you feel very strongly that Slack is a replacement for email. Yep. So tell everyone about that and then sort of speak to the troglodytes like me who think Slack is nice, but... So you're saying all the younger employees use it, but the older people don't. I'm saying... <laughs> I'm saying how, how long till retirement? <laughs> I'm saying that one older employee was slower <laughs> to adopt. Um, I don't know if you. Oh, I'm, sure, I'm sure you do remember this, but there was this moment um, where in 1996 I walked into my father's office. Uh, he was a real estate developer, and it probably happened a couple years before. But it was the first time I noticed that everyone had a computer on their desk because, like, in '91, probably just the accountant had a computer, and then suddenly the um, Architects had a computer, the business people had a computer, even the receptionists had a computer. And it was around that time, 96, um, when the internet started spreading through uh, businesses. But it took like 96 to 2003, 2005 for everyone to start using email. And both of us remember um, people photocopying things and rolling them up in a little tube and putting them in the cubby holes. And, and well, stuff I've like seen that. videos about that sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, was, um, there was plenty of time where people thought, what is this shit? This, email. It's driving me crazy. Okay. So it, I think it's, it's just a process of transition, and it, it can be tough for people to wrap their head around, and it will take a little bit of time, because Slack is fundamentally a new category. It's, um, you move from a model which is very focused around the individual, so inbox-based, to conversations happening in what we call channels, and that's a team-first or an organization-first approach to communication. And the difference is that everyone sees the same thing. So if you look in your email inbox, it's uh, different than everyone else's. Everyone's is kind of partial and fragmented and unique. Um, but I actually tell the story um, for m most of our large customers, we have an, a channel called accounts dash and then the name of the customer. So two years ago, we were closing Oracle, which would be, at the time, our second biggest customer. So this is obviously a big deal for us. And there was a hun literally 100 people on their side, so security, IT, finance, legal, procurement. Um, and there's about two dozen people working on our side to close this deal, and it takes like six or nine months. So everything happened in that channel. So when the lawyers got off a call, um, they would put the update in the channel. The account executive knew what was going on. And I have an elaborate eight-minute version of this story, but I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll cut it short with um, the power of that is pretty incredible. So I'm the CEO of this company. This is going to be our second biggest customer. And over the course of that six to nine months, I never once asked anyone, what's up with Oracle? How's it going? Give me an update. I would just look in the channel. I could see here's where you are in the vendor approval process. Here's the security review. Here's the commercial negotiations. And that's, uh, that's really incredible, that kind of transparency inside the organization. So people put the same, actually people put like slightly less effort into the communication because they only have to send the message once. Um, but the return on that effort of communication is much higher. And here's the crazy thing. Uh, for all of us, if you could, there's a Twilight Zone episode where he has a stopwatch or a clock, a pocket watch, and he drops it and it shatters and then time freezes. But if you could freeze time in a modern office anywhere in the world and just like walk around and look at what everyone was doing at the moment you froze time, more than half, maybe 60% of people are spending their effort on um, kind of basic acts of coordination. So they're working on a slide deck to be presented at a meeting that's giving an update. They're doing project planning. They're doing quarterly business reviews. And uh, 
it might sound like that I'm being dismissive of that. I actually think it's really, really, really important, which is why people spend half their time. And if you're a manager, you spend 90 to 100% of your time on communication. Probably the person inside your company that spends the least amount of time on internal communication is still spending a quarter or a third of their time. So um, if you can get leverage on that activity, if you can get a boost, I don't think that Slack's ultimately gonna save people time, maybe a, a little tiny bit, but you get a lot more out of it. You get a lot more alignment, you get a lot more transparency, um, and that makes a real difference to how people perform. So maybe another way of, 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 of thinking about it, you're saying, is that email, while powerful, is sort of unidimensional. And this new category of software that you're talking about that Slack is one of the leaders in is multidimensional in terms of communications. Yeah, and I think it's, I mean, uh, I should say that I don't think email should go away in the general sense. I think email, it's a virtue that it's lowest common denominator. So anyone can run an IMAP server, anyone can run a SMTP server, anyone can create an email address and participate in this global network. But uh, all of the other stuff you get, so every, the, the receipt for every Amazon purchase or Lyft ride or Uber ride or whatever, um, the wedding invitations and the birth announcements and the dumb jokes from family members mixed in with important contracts um, <laughs> is not a, it's, there's a high cognitive tax, but the real issue is uh, you show up for your first day on a new job, um, it's one of our big customers. So some customer that has like you know, 10 or 20, 25,000, 50,000 daily active users of Slack, you have an empty inbox. So you're completely cut off from the history. And at one of those companies, there could have been hundreds of millions, billions, and even tens of billions of messages sent before you got there, and you have access to none of them. Mm -hmm. And that's crazy. And that, well, I think that will seem increasingly crazy as time goes on. I can appreciate that, it, yeah, from a, from a Slack user perspective. Um, I want to ask, uh, you go a little bit deeper on some of the things that Slack is doing. I think you've alluded to this, but your customer base are enterprise companies, right? That, that's who pays the bills. That's who you're after. Talk about, uh, uh, talk about what enterprise key management is, what email bridge is, and what shared channels are, because these are your big initiatives for companies, right? Sure. And um, I... Uh, I should have said, today is the last day of our quiet period, but it ends at the end of the calendar day. Um, so I have no updates on numbers, and I have forgotten what our last update on customer count was, but I believe it's 95,000, so I don't want to uh, put that out as a fact. Point is, there's only 500 companies in the Fortune 500, um, and there's... Um, <laughs> There are many, many tens of thousands of, of companies in Slack. So I think you're right. It is there yeah, are. Excuse me. I have 95,000 paid customers, 10 million plus active <sighs> okay. daily users, 645 paid customers. So that's yeah. the relatively not not old old numbers, but your published yeah. numbers. Yeah, 95,000 paid customers. Yes. Yeah. So there um, there are dental offices and tax preparers and cattle farmers and hoteliers and um, people running restaurants and all kinds of businesses. But we do have a, a, a bunch of really big customers as well. Uh, and the bigger the customer and the more regulated the industry, uh, the, the more obscure the requirements start to get. So um, one that, uh, I mean, so things like uh, FINRA for financial services organizations or HIPAA in healthcare. Um, a, a big important one for a lot of organizations is the ability to hold their own encryption keys, so which means that they can pull the key and they kind of destroy all the data. Um, that's, uh, that's stored in Slack. And there's a bunch of reasons why they would do that. You could do it selectively, and, and um, that was a really important one for us. It's also, you know, there's challenges in being, uh, about a half of our daily active users are outside the US, and Japan's mm -hmm. our second mm -hmm. biggest country. In Europe, particularly, there's, um, there's probably a more skeptical eye towards US-based companies and US-based um, services with respect to where the data is stored. So uh, EKM is one way to, to get around that. Uh, share channels, I'll just do super briefly. Two Slack using organizations can share a channel. Administrators on either end opt to, to, to enter into this, and each side controls their own access. So we use um, it with literally thousands of other people at uh, professional services firms you work with, outside agencies, uh, creative agencies, uh, commercial real estate brokers, and, and all stuff like that. Um, really big. And then the last one, email bridge, is the ability for people to participate in Slack conversations via email. So if you look at a really, like, we have, I, th I think now, 150,000 daily active users at IBM, but there's 450,000 IBM employees. So there's kind of, there are people who work at the, the penumbra, the periphery, 
um, <laughs> where some of them are in Slack and some of them are in email. So uh, if you're able to bridge back and forth between them, it uh, creates a lot of value. I want to clarify something I misstated a moment ago. Your published numbers are that you have 645 paid customers with revenues of greater than $100,000, yes. annual yeah. revenues greater than $100,000. So there's like, those are the big enterprise the big, customers. Yeah, the big, OK. Um, the conventional wisdom, and this has been conventional wisdom for the last several years, is that Microsoft, which is pretty good at productivity software and has a product called Teams, is going to kill Slack because they are so much bigger, so much, so they have so many more customers. Why, in, why is the conventional wisdom wrong? There's so many dimensions here. But first, uh, Microsoft is an incredible company, and. Um, that's very nice of you to say. You don't I'm, know I'm a big admirer. No, but it's true. They're also, they're also been a great partner for us. So there's a huge, uh, like there's 500,000 active developers on the Slack platform. And because um, Microsoft would like them using Azure, Azure has been a great partner. Uh, we just launched Office 365, calendar integration, and a bunch of other stuff. Huh. Um, so they, we're, um, they're big enough, I guess, not, not us. They're big enough that they end up working with and competing with all kinds of people around the world. Um, but I think the reason that we don't spend a lot of time worrying about it is, um, well, maybe two reasons. One is, whatever Microsoft does, um, we're still going to do the same thing that we would do for customers. So um, if the performance of our applications, like the number of milliseconds it takes to start up, is an important thing for customers, we will do that. If shared channels are an important feature, we will develop shared channels. It doesn't really matter what, um, what, uh, what Microsoft does. But having said that, I think the emphasis has been a little bit different. Um, ours, uh, our emphasis has been really broadly on interoperability, because we would like to be the 2% of your software budget that's a multiplier on the value of the other 98%. So there's 1,600 apps in the app directory, but there's also 450,000 different, and this is the kind of a mind-boggling one, 450,000 different applications developed internally by our customers that are actively used every week on the Slack platform. So that can be things like notifications flowing in or workflow approvals or purchase orders. Um, all I mean, it's, it's really, it's varied because teams in finance and legal and um, engineering and sales, customer support, all use it for different purposes. But that activity is, uh, is really important to us and where we see Slack going. So the, you have a lot of interesting detail and color, but it, it sort of skirts the question that if Microsoft could do as well, and again, this is the conventional wisdom, if they can be almost as good, mm -hmm. they should be able to beat you because of their, in, their, their installed base, which is lo so much larger than Slack. Yeah, it's of office. I'm yeah, I think there's two two different paths I could take this, and I'll do. Well, whoa, I'll do both quickly, and you can decide which one is more interesting. But um, one is, it, have you seen that photo of uh, the Microsoft team in 1977 when they're still in Albuquerque? Sure, sure. Yeah, so if, if you the big, haven't the big glasses. Yeah, Google Microsoft Albuquerque, uh, 1977. Um, Five years later, they kind of pulled the rug under, for, out from under IBM, which was at the time the biggest, most powerful, and most valuable company in the world. Um, and you go forward about 17 years from there. This one is kind of mind-blowing. So Microsoft has 95% share of operating systems with Windows. It has 90-plus percent share of internet browsers with Internet Explorer. It bought Hotmail, it had MSN, it had uh, probably the biggest engineering presence for, uh, for stuff online. So it literally controlled almost all of humanity's access to the internet. And they saw this little company in Mountain View um, starting to make a real business around search. And over the next couple decades, tens of billions of dollars into that. And I don't know what their market share is now, 9% or something like that. So you might think that's special because the people at Google are real geniuses. Um, but same thing happened. like. Six or seven years later, 2007, Google sees um, Facebook. People are spending a lot of time on social networks. That might be a good medium for advertising as well. And uh, probably everyone remembers this. If you wanted to comment on a video on YouTube, you had to use Google+. Uh, I think the only time that Google ever promoted anything on its homepage, it was Google+. It was promoted in Gmail. Um, and it didn't matter. I mean, the fact that they had a thousand times more engineers, a thousand times more resources. Uh, they had access to hundreds and hundreds, maybe over a billion users even by that point. It just didn't make a difference. So the lesson that we take from that is that a small, smaller company, um, if it has real traction with customers, in some cases has a bit of an advantage against a large incumbent with multiple lines of business. And this is like the first 40 or 50 pages of the innovator's dilemma. Right. So we can. We, yeah, we could we could debate it on and on, but your your history is on your is on your side. Yeah. Is, 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 There's plenty of companies that have been crushed as well, yeah. but I think that it, it's it's harder. And I mean, I, 
harder, not because there's anything wrong with Microsoft, because this is hard for us at this point, given yeah. the size we're at. It's hard to maintain a real focus on quality, on user experience, um, and the bigger you get, the harder it is. So if, if um, the competition was based on the quality of user experience, and that's where all the effort is, that would be probably more daunting for us. If it's based on the bigger distribution, I don't think that's really a threat. Because we're living in a world now, this is, I said it too, this is the second one, it's very short. Um, people have a choice. You know, there's not, 20 years ago, if you wanted to use software at the office, you had to use it yeah. on your Windows PC. There was no other way. And Microsoft domain controllers uh, controlled what access you had, so everything came through IT. And once there was web software, once there was Android, once there was iOS, there's near infinite ways for end users to, to get software or vice versa. Um, and it's really, it's uncontrollable. So people make choices. Your question's for Stuart. There's one right in the front. If I could get a microphone right there, please. Please just stand up and identify yourself. Hi, Stuart. Tim Zaney from KPMG. First, uh, thanks for being a great customer of ours. Um, second. It's true. <laughs> we are here to do business. Go on, Tim. <laughs> But uh, more, more importantly, uh, talk a little bit about your human capital strategy. You know, we're at you know, all-time lows and unemployment rates. The Bay Area is really tough. You've now gone from private to public company. How's that impacting your human capital strategy? Well, I mean, it's been... Human capital it means people, right? Is yes. It, it, yeah, okay. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> Remember the first time I heard HCM as a... Yeah, yeah well, that's a big deal, I think. Uh, so it is a very competitive environment. There's one thing that's really interesting. So it, I should say, the Bay Area is a terrible place to recruit. It's very competitive. It's insanely expensive for everything, not just. Um, and it's one part of it's not even money, right? Like I think we pay 100 bucks a square foot for office space in San Francisco, and we pay 30 bucks a square foot in Denver. But it's not just that. It's that we can just get a bunch more in Denver if we want it, and we can't get it in San Francisco. Like we just finished renovating and moving all these people into our new headquarters. We have one big building, and now already we have another spillover building, and there just isn't something to, to switch to. Um, but yeah, it's a very tough market. It hasn't really, uh, I think being public is actually probably a little bit of an advantage for us in recruiting in the Bay Area, because the emphasis there is on technology and engineering, and engineers are remarkably conservative. So we had to compete for years against Google and Facebook with liquid RSUs and kind of offers that made sense, and we had to tell people, um, you should join us. We're going to change the world, and um, it was it was tough. So I think that that's a bit of an advantage. But we're a global company. We have um, I'm not sure what I think we are just about to open in some place that I'm probably not allowed to mention. But uh, last time I checked, it was 12 offices in nine countries, I think, um, and growing really quickly everywhere. In the in North America, I'm especially interested in Denver. We're doing a bunch of expansion there, and in Toronto. Um, and uh, I would love to see more and more growth there. And it's, to be honest, it's not just the cost savings. That's not it. It's, um, th it's a vibe. Like, when I go to a Toronto office, they're just super happy to work there. It's great. They're not, there isn't a million other companies constantly headhunting them. You're um, also talking yeah. your Canadian book right now, right? I am talking my Canadian book. Uh, it was tough being in the Bay Area with the Raptors versus the Warriors. Um, but, uh, but it's also, it's just, uh, <laughs> There's a, there's a very, title, that's fine. <laughs> there's, a, there's a very different, um, I don't know, like way of life, I guess. I'm, okay. I'm someone who loved San Francisco um, in like, like the late 90s um, and have <laughs> loved it less over time because it is, it's kind of a, like a one, one company town at this point. Obviously, yes. there's many companies, but it's one, one topic dominates everything. Yes, yeah. I can relate. Please. Right here. I'll answer them more quickly. I apologize. Stefan Heck from Noto, um, a convert to Slack three years ago. Um, I'm curious how much you actually use Slack to make business decisions, and in particular, how you as a CEO decide which channel to read and which decisions to share with whom, because obviously it's a great communications medium, but can it help you make decisions? Yeah. Um, I think it, it really helps with focus, and there's a lot, and I, I think one thing we haven't done a good job on is um, kind of getting the best practices out there and educating people. Um, helping keep us focused is pretty amazing. So here's one little tip, and this is not the, the, end, the biggest one, but um, for each of my direct reports, I have a channel called Agendas, their name, stash, Stuart. 
And anytime we think of something we want to talk about, we put it in there so that when we have our one-on-one -on -one meeting, we have the agenda all ready to go, and it helps us keep us focused. Because we still have a direct message conversation, but the direct message conversation is all kinds of stuff. It's back and forth. It's, hey, I'm going to be five minutes late. You can get started without me, you know, that, that kind of stuff. Um, but there are thousands of those little tricks, and to the extent that you're able to uh, help those spread and develop some discipline inside the culture, you get a lot more out of it. So I'm in thousands of channels, and I don't find it overwhelming because we have a real discipline around when to use notifications and when to mention people's names, and so there's a, a small list that I need to focus on. And uh, would you real briefly tell everybody how you mentioned your direct reports, how many direct reports you have, and some of the work that you're, you're doing personally on being a uh, CEO and a leader at a time your company is changing so much. Yeah, this is I, the, I read you have a coach, and that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, I have, for, this is the fun part for me, because uh, if you go back 10 years, like when, when I left Flickr, when I left Yahoo uh, 2008. Uh, Stuart was a co-founder of Flickr, which Yahoo bought. He stuck around for a while. Yeah, I was just a horrible, horrible manager, like OK leader. Um, <laughs> And um, as the company has gotten larger, and I've been you know, not allowed to spend as much time on product stuff and had to spend more time on, on leadership, it's been like a constant, like the, it's gotten harder at exactly the right rate for me. So I get better, it gets harder, so I'm terrible again, and then I have to get better. Um, but I don't know the number, to be honest. I think 11 or 12, which is probably a few too many. But there do seem to be two strategies. One is like three to five, and one is eight to 15, even. Because um, the people who report to me don't require any supervision. Mm. You know, it's, it's a mm -hmm. little bit different than, than managing other people. Um, yeah, I've learned to be much more careful with what I say. <laughs> In, internally and externally. Yeah. yeah. Please, uh, where are you? There you are. Please, just stand up and identify yourself. Try again. Sim Semino from Swoop. Stuart, we're a customer and very happy with the product. Thank you. People talk about Slack as a platform company because you focused on APIs very early, have tons of integrations. But I'm curious whether you're primarily a connecting sort of fabric for various other services, or whether you're actually seeing companies that are building meaningful businesses that actually are driving meaningful revenues because of the Slack API capability. Yeah, so that's a great question. And uh, I think it's actually, it's a little bit of both. Um, there are, you can't just make anything and have it run uh, inside of Slack, but I think you can be, and if you're a new SaaS company, you probably should be Slack first in the way that people used to talk about mobile first. Um, I actually did, I asked for this number recently. Uh, nine Slack first companies have been acquired, um, and I don't know the, the current number, but I think we've invested in about 30 companies through the Slack fund. So there is that, but I think most of it is actually, it's a little bit different. Once you, you said uh, fabric, and that's actually a term that we use, so kind of like a lightweight fabric for systems integration, because we go to a customer, they've already made a choice for what they use for HCM or, or HR software, um, what they use for financials, what they use for CRM, what they use for uh, source control. And because we integrate with all of them, you have this kind of like these channels uh, that tie together the whole organization and conversations course through them, but so do references to customer support tickets or records in Salesforce or uh, purchase order approvals or whatever. And um, that's, that's when, I, when I said before, 2% of the software budget, that's a multiplier on the value of the other 98%. It's both. It's, so it's inside Slack and everything else. But have you made any effort to quantify the commerce that goes on among the developers on, this, on the Slack platform? We haven't, but, um, but the level of activity is really enormous. And obviously, it's a great thing for us. 90% uh, plus of our paid customers use integrations on a daily basis. Um, and so it's, it's a real value add and driver for the business. I apologize, but quick question and quick answer, please. All right. Thank you. Uh, hi, Rangan from Pole to Win. Um, Firstly, I'd like to applaud the fact that you made a disruptive communication platform. Um, the question I had is, uh, again, you know, correlating with John, who had asked a question earlier. The video gaming industry is number one right now in entertainment. You know, 2.5 billion gamers out there, you know, with revenues over Hollywood, over anyone else out there. Can we ever see Slack competing with uh, communication platforms like Discord for gaming? And what does the future for Slack look like in the video gaming industry? There's a whole story which we don't have time to get into now that we started as a video game making company, so I have a lot of uh, you know, solidarity. Um, <laughs> but I, I think Slack is really designed for groups of people who are aligned around the accomplishment of some goal or set of goals. Uh, that could be your clan winning in a, a MMO or something like that, but I think it's much more likely to be a business or a nonprofit or a governmental organization. Um, 
And so I don't, I don't see us as um, someone who's really going to help. I think that's the reason that Discord has flourished, to be honest. I mean, they're, um, it's a different focus, a different emphasis, and um, there, it is a really big and exciting market. I just saw the Gary Bettman, the commissioner of the NHL, um, say, no, I don't know about eSports. And then uh, the person <laughs> I was sitting next to looked it up at 8 million audience for the NHL finals last year and 110 million for League of Legends. So. It's a, it is a very big and growing industry. So, so your, your personal history and interest is not withstanding. Gaming is not uh, front of mind for Slack technology. You know, this might be a good place to, to end it. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, um, I don't even know that I'm a gamer, per se. I mean, I do, I do play a little bit, but it's mostly like laying on the couch end of the night on my iPhone, like <laughs> um, trying to relax. Um, I, uh, I got online in 1992. I was exposed to the internet. It blew my mind, and everything to me uh, is about the use of computing technology to facilitate human interaction. And that could be a massively multiplayer game. It could be massively multiplayer photo sharing. It could be massively multiplayer uh, workplace software. I don't care. I just like making software, and I especially like making it for people to interact with one another. Stuart, congratulations on your success, and thank you. Thank you.